I think it's safe to say that Necrons are going to be making a big impact over the next few months. With that in mind, let's try and get to know how they work a bit better. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. Today we're back for another Know Your Enemy video and we're going to be focusing on the primary antagonists of 9th edition, the undead skeletons in space that are the Necrons. I'm well aware that they're going to be getting a large influx of new units and likely a lot of their rules might be changing when it comes to 9th edition. I'm sure points and special rules will certainly be tweaked, plus they'll be getting a ton of new synergy with all of these new units, but I strongly suspect that a large amount of their core rules and mechanics will be staying the same. With that in mind, I thought it would be helpful to get to know the various different types of Necrons, some of the sneaky tricks that they can pull on the table, to hopefully better prepare yourself for meeting the endless Necron legions when they start to roll out in 9th. We're going to go through this all fairly quickly, with a brief discussion of all the things and abilities to be aware of, with maybe a few little bits about simple countermeasures as we go along. We'll look at their core rules, the Necron unit roster, their relics and warlord traits, and some of their sneaky stratagems that can catch you off guard. So without further ado, let's jump straight into it. Let's start off with a quick discussion of the Necron's core army rules then. The most important one that most people will be aware of are the reanimation protocols, which means that if you have a partially depleted squad of Necrons, then you make a roll for every single model that's been slain in that unit over the entire course of the game, and on a 5+, they're set back up in that unit at the start of the Necron turn. Basically this means that any unit that you partially kill will have a chance of just regenerating the slain casualties, and this can be incredibly punishing if you don't manage to fully wipe a unit. The roll can further be augmented by Cryptex, giving it plus one to the roll, and there's a couple of abilities that allow you to actually roll twice for it, such as the Necron Lord Resurrection Orb or the Ghost Dark. For the Necron player, this generally incentivizes taking large units of Necrons, whether that's 20-man warrior blobs, 10-man immortal blobs, or units of 6 destroyers and things. It means that they're a lot more incentivized to pay the 2 command points to automatically pass morale tests. If they lose a large amount of casualties, they just have a few models left, because if that squad stays around, then it means that they could be getting a huge amount of models back next turn. As the countering player, it really incentivizes you to fully wipe out Necron units, because then this mechanic won't even come into effect whatsoever. If you're playing against Necrons, you really need to be disciplined in the shooting phase. Basically, you just need to make sure you absolutely wipe out Necron units. You don't want to leave just one or two casualties left, otherwise you could be gifting your opponent an enormous amount of free models. Other common rules include Living Metal, which is present on some vehicles and characters, and in a similar fashion, they generally heal one wound per turn. Again, further incentivizes fully killing them rather than leaving them damaged. Quantum Shielding is a common rule on some of their lighter vehicles, and this one can really spoil your anti-tank fire. Basically, when you deal a certain amount of damage with one single attack, say you dealt five damage with a lucky last cannon shot, the Necron player rolls a dice, and if they roll less than that number, then the shot has absolutely no effect at all. This means that it's actually far stronger against higher damage weapons, and it can almost completely negate really high damage weapons, say if they're flat damage 6 weapons, the Necron player only needs to roll anything 5 or less to make that shot completely go away. This is definitely a spoiler type rule, and something to be aware of before you're fighting Necrons. It means that in general, the guns that you want to be pointing at their vehicles with this rule, you want to generally have damage D3, damage 2, or damage 3. That way they're going to be unlikely to make this safe. They have their number as Legion, their name is Death, which is basically their obsec for their troops, much like any other army. A lot of their warriors carry Tesla weapons, high strength, low AP weapons. They have a special rule where you roll a 6+, plus, then they get two additional hits. This synergizes amazingly with any Necron Lords that are giving plus one to hit to their infantry, as it means that you can absolutely overwhelm the enemy in saves. Finally, much like virtually any other race, they get Dynastic Codes. These are their chapter tactics, essentially, and they can get various powerful abilities. Certain agents are exempt from this, things like Triarch Praetorians and Triarch Stalkers, Catan Shards, and some other characters. So let's talk briefly about those Dynastic Codes, then. The Necrons only have five so far. I suspect this will be expanded in the 9th edition codex, particularly with that new dynasty that we've already seen previewed. Possibly the most common are the Sautek dynasty, they have relentless advance, basically no penalty to moving and shooting heavy weapons, and they can treat any weapons as assault weapons if they do advance, though they will suffer the minus one to hit penalty for this. Mobility is great, but I think it's the other benefits that really sell this as one of the strongest dynasties. Their warlord trait gives you easy command point regeneration, which is always good for getting more sneaky tricks off, and they basically have the same stratagem as overlapping fields of fire for the Imperial Guard, where if one unit damages an enemy unit, then everything else gets plus one to their hit rolls against that, so it can really let a Sautek gunline really destroy one single enemy target, and those plus one to hit rolls can be great for Tesla weapons. 
They also have access to things like Imitech the Stormlord and a couple of the other Dynasty specific characters. Mephrit has Solar Fury, this is basically a little bit of extra AP, and you get AP-1 on all of your guns if they're within half range of the enemy. This one is very solid, but it is a little bit inflexible in terms of movement, as sometimes you will want to keep at arm's length. Nefrek is a mobility related code, their translocation beams give you an advantage for advancing. When your warriors advance, it means that they will essentially beam from one place to another, and can sort of move across enemy models as if they had the fly special rule. They also automatically advance 6 inches whenever they advance. Naturally this is going to be best with anything with assault weapons, and they can also be great with things like wraiths, who can advance and charge, which means that you could have an automatic 6 inch moving wraith, and pull off some ridiculously long charges from when the wraith started. On top of this, this is the one that allows you to deep strike with any Necron infantry unit, so you could potentially have big blobs of warriors coming straight out of reserve, which they can access for a stratagem. Nihilak is reroll ones to hit when standing still, a nice solid buff to shooting, but not the most flexible, can be good for an isolated detachment of gun platforms such as Doomsday Arcs, who aren't wanting to move anyway. They also have a stratagem which means that they can get plus one to save as a reactive defensive buff, which can be really solid on certain units, as I believe it does affect invul saves as well. Finally, Novok are the close combat Necrons. Their awakened by murder traits will typically give them re-roll hit rolls in the first round of the fight phase, unless they're consolidating or consolidated into as the first action. Basically, this is prime choice for a close combat Necron detachment, so if they're coming at you with flayed ones or wraiths, then it's perfectly possible that they might be run with this. Let's run through the Necron unit list now. This won't be a full in-depth review, but we'll just talk about a few salient points that could help you understand the Necron army and how it functions. In terms of HQs, Imitech the Stormlord is a Sautec Necron Lord, as well as all the stuff that the Overlords can do down below. He also can activate a Mortal Wound Bomb, essentially, once per game, where he chooses a unit in his line of sight. That unit takes D6 Mortal Wounds, and units nearby that unit also take D3 Mortal Wounds on the roll of a 4+. If he's around, you might consider spreading out a bit. He also provides the Necrons with 1 command points, and regenerates D3 wounds each turn. He's a pretty solid character, all in all. Necron Overlords can either be fielded on foot, or on this Catacomb command barge, which you can see on the right. They're generally pretty tough, fighty characters, with strength and toughness 5, war size usually making them strength 7, AP-4, and 2 damage, and they buff Necron troops around them with the Wave of Command or My Will Be Done special rule. This gives them plus 1 to their movement, and also to their hit rolls for the unit nominated, but they can only nominate 1 Necron unit per turn. It means that they're often seen next to large blobs of Necron warriors or immortals, meaning that those units will be hitting on 2s, which is particularly potent with Necron immortal Tesla weapons. They can also bear a Resurrection Orb, which is the one that allows you to roll the reanimation protocols a second time, allowing that squad to really get back up in earnest. Trazen the Infinite is a variant of a Necron Lord, who has the special rule where on a 2+, if he dies, he will essentially take command of another character in the Necron army, even if it's something a little bit more lowly like a Cryptek or a Lord. If he's the Warlord, then he's going to be hard to remove. Talking of Cryptex, they're nowhere near as good in combat, but are really quite good little support characters for the Necron army, as they give plus one to the reanimation protocols, meaning the Necrons will be getting up on fours. They can also take a Chronometron, which gives Necron infantry units within three inches a five plus invul save, which really is quite a decent survivability boost if you can stack it on multiple infantry units. Destroyer Lords are some of the fightiest characters in the book, and they provide reroll wound rolls of one for nearby units of destroyers, which is pretty handy. They're quite good for fighting because they move a fair bit faster as well, with that destroyer body giving them a 10 inch move and fly. Finally, standard Necron Lords give a standard lieutenant sort of aura, where they reroll wound rolls of 1 for infantry within 6 inches. It is only infantry though, not vehicles. I'm afraid we have skipped over a few special characters just for sake of brevity. For the troops, their main two choices are warriors or immortals. Warriors are toughness 4, 4 plus save units with a leadership of 10, and they can be taken in units up to 20, which can make them quite hard to remove. Their Gauss Flayers are basically the same as Space Marine Bolters, except they have minus 1 AP. I think Immortals are seen to be the slightly more competitive choice at the moment, though they do pay a few more points. They have a 3 plus save, and access to far more dangerous weapons in the Gauss Blaster, with a Rapid Fire Strength 5 24 inches weapon or the Tesla Carbine, which is Assault 2, Strength 5, with the Tesla rule, which means exploding sixes. Moving on to some of their other elite choices. First of all, let's talk about Katarn. These are Toughness 7, 8 wound character models with a 4 plus invul save. You can get three variants in the Nightbringer and Deceiver and Transcendent Katarn, all of which do slightly different things. 
The Nightbring is a little bit more fatty in combat, and has a powerful 12-inch Gaze of Death shooting attack, which can really go through infantry quite quickly. The Deceiver allows the Necron player to redeploy D3 units at the start of the game, so if he's on the board, then bear in mind that the Necron player might be able to react a bit better to your deployment. The Transcendent Katarn can use his Fractured Personality, which allows the Necron player to roll for two random statline buffs, or choose one of their liking. They all get access to Powers of the Katarn, they each know two and can cast one each turn. They're basically generally mortal wound generating spells of one sort or another, and they'll generally do more damage the closer the Katarn are to your lines. Typical ones include Sky of Falling Stars for three units getting D3 mortal wounds on a 4+, or one that allows every unit to get D3 mortal wounds on a 4+, plus if they're within 9 inches of the Katarn. It's basically not too dissimilar for psychic powers, but of course they aren't psychic powers, so you can't dispel them. They're very much the demon princes of the Necron world. Turning to the rest of their elite section, we have Death Marks. These guys have hunters from hyperspace, so can set up in reserve with their 24-inch ranged sniper weapons, and they can choose to intercept one of your units coming in from reserve, jumping down at the same time as that unit, and getting a free shooting attack at them. This could be particularly devastating for something like Smash Captains, who they could have a very real chance of taking out with a large unit as soon as they drop down to do their thing. Flayed Ones are Necron Close Combat variants, who also have Innate Deep Strike, their Strength 4, 3 attacks, and they re-roll Wound Rolls in Close Combat, so they're going to be strongest against things that don't have a particularly great save. In Novok, they could be re-rolling all hit rolls and wound rolls, absolutely burying you under numbers of attacks. Lich Guard are fairly expensive elite choices, with Toughness 5, 2 wounds, and either the powerful Strength 7, Damage 2, War Scythe, or a Hyperphase Sword, which is a Strength 5 power weapon that gives them an additional attack. If they take the Hyperphase Sword, they can also get a Dispersion Shield, which gives them a 4 plus invul, making them significantly tougher, and they have a Stratagem for this, which can also boost them to a 3 plus and reflect mortal wounds back at the opponent. There's the two Triarch units, Triarch Praetorians and Triarch Stalkers, who don't get Dynastic Codes. The Praetorians are jump infantry with decent close range and melee damage output with their Rods of the Covenant. Again, their toughness 5 and 2 wounds, so they're at least reasonably hard to remove. The Triarch Stalker is a 10 wound vehicle with quantum shielding. It has mediocre damage output, but when it targets a unit, it does allow other Necrons to re-roll hit rolls of 1 against that selected unit, which means that it can be a bit of a buffing thing as well as just a gun platform. In Fast Attack, we find Canoptic Scarabs and Canoptic Wraiths. Scarabs are kind of a chaff unit with toughness 3, 3 wounds and a 6 plus save, and they can be regenerated by tomb spiders, and they have a stratagem that allows one to detonate for d3 mortal wounds, which could be useful situationally. Canoptic wraiths can be a real problem unit to deal with, you can get squads of up to 6 of them, they move quickly with a 12 inch move, and essentially it's similar to a fly rule, which means they just pass through enemy units. I've got some reasonable AP damage to claws, which will mean they're a relatively decent close combat threat against virtually everything. Most problematically, they also have toughness 5 and a 3 plus inball save, which means that one way or the other, you are very much going to need mass shooting to clear out a unit of them. They can be particularly nasty when combined with being able to advance and charge, which they can do with a stratagem, and you can also give them reanimation protocols for a turn, meaning that if they were depleted in number just down to one model, your opponent could potentially get a whole load of wraiths back on the board, and that could be a very scary prospect indeed. Next we have destroyers, like this guy on the right, and it looks like these guys will be getting very big new models in the new codex. At the moment, they're toughness 5, 3 wounds, and are generally armed with their gauss cannon, which is strength 6, AP-3, and damage D3 although the Heavy Destroyer anti-tank variant does exist as well. They can be taken in units of 6, and as they have decent movement, they're often able to keep relatively safe, and you're going to struggle to wipe them all out in one turn. The best thing about Destroyers is their excellent 1 command point stratagem, which allows them to reroll all or his and wound rolls for a turn, so you'll often see a unit of 6 of these putting out some extraordinarily strong fire with this stratagem, just as a very efficient extra source of firepower in a Necron list with that stratagem. Tomb Blades are the fast attack jet bikes of the Necrons, their toughness 5 and 2 wounds, and they're innately minus 1 to hit. They do move very quickly indeed, so it can be a good skirmishing threat with 14 inch movement. They have some decent shooting with either Gauss or Tesla, and can either have a 3 plus save with shield veins, or the ability to innately ignore cover. If we move on to the flyers and heavies, we have Night Scythes and Doom Scythes, the dreaded croissants of the Necron Air Force. Night Scythes aren't considered all that strong at the moment, they have 8 Tesla shots and deploy units via invasion beams sort of allowing Necron units to deep strike onto the board. Doom Scythes are very much often seen in competitive Necron lists though. They have the same 8 Tesla shots, but a 
D3 shot Death Ray with strength 10 and damage D6. If you take 3 Doom Sires, then they also have the ability to come behind fire and throw down a scary mortal wound bomb, where the Necron player, instead of firing the Doom Sires weapons, picks one spot on the battlefield, and every unit within 3 inches of that takes 3d3 mortal wounds on the roll of a 4 plus. If you've bunched up a few vehicles, then that can be some truly scary damage output, and certainly has the ability to blast a lot of your models straight off the board. In the heavy support section we have the Annihilation Barge, this is a fairly cheap 8 wound Tesla and Gauss platform whose guns have a 24 inch range, it's got toughness 6 and it's protected by quantum shielding so it can be a little bit hard for dedicated anti-tank fire to remove efficiently. Canoptech Spiders are generally a support unit though they can pose some melee threat, they can be allowed to repair Necron vehicles a little bit more efficiently with Fabricator Claws. A 5 point upgrade can give them a deny the witch power in the gloom prism, and they can restore depleted canoptic scarab swarms with their scarab hive ability. Doomsday arcs are one of Necron's more competitive units, basically they just want to sit at the back and fire their enormous doomsday cannon every single turn. They're really a significant challenge to remove unlike the annihilation barge, because again they have toughness 6, but this time they have 14 wounds, and when they're protected by quantum shielding it means that all of their high damage weapons against them are just really not all that efficient. They do have to stand still to fire their Doomsday Cannon on the better profile, but it gets D6, Strength 10, AP-5, D6 damage shots, so sort of an average of 3 or 4 Super Las Cannons per turn, provided they can stay still. They're even not too bad at close range as well, being equipped with 10 Gauss Flayers, so they can put out 20 shots at close range if the enemy does get close. Stat-wise, they're certainly one of the strongest units in the Necron decks. Heavy Destroyers allow you to field entire squads of the anti-tank variant of Destroyers, Monoliths aren't taken very much these days as they're a bit too overcosted. Their toughness 8, 20 wounds, and only have mediocre firepower, though they have some interesting abilities with their portal to generate mortal wounds or redeploy Necron warriors. Their super heavies are the Obelisk and the Tesseract Vault. The Obelisk, again, is really underwhelming. It doesn't really do all that much besides some Tesla fire. They're not really all that much for its points. The Tesseract Vault is significantly more expensive, but it does come with a 4 plus invul save, and it can activate 3 of those powers of the Katarn that we mentioned before. This means that it can be quite a powerful and scary mortal wound generating machine, and when they were costed a bit less, we did start to see these spammed a bit on tournament tables. They're definitely not quite as scary as they used to be though. Finally, we have Ghost Arcs like this one on the right. These are 120 point troop transports. They can transport 10 Necron warriors or characters. Again, they have 14 wounds and quantum shielding, so are annoying to remove. They have the Gauss Flayers for decent firepower up close, and they can also allow warriors to resurrect twice in a turn, much like resurrection orbs, so could certainly have the power to regenerate a bunch of warriors over the course of a game if you do leave squads undestroyed. Moving on to the Warlord traits and relics of the Necron army, really there's two that stand out above the rest. You can get a few more personal traits like reducing the damage on the Warlord by 1, getting plus 3 to their aura abilities, re-rolling charges within 6 inches, which could be handy for things like deep striking and flayed ones. But I'd say the two most typically taken are either Immortal Pride, which provides a 6 inch fearless bubble, which is excellent on big squads of warriors or immortals, which they will really want to be taking because of those reanimation protocol benefits. And on top of this, you also get to deny a psychic power as well, which is quite a good bonus in itself. The other one is the Sautek one, which allows you to regenerate command points on a 5 plus, so it'll just give you more access to stratagems and things over the game, which is a very handy bonus, plus you get one free reroll. In terms of their relics, there were three that I really wanted to talk about, the main one being the Veil of Darkness, which is certainly one to be aware of. If an enemy Necron has this, then it means that once per game, they can teleport the bearer and an infantry squad within 6 inches to anywhere on the board that's 9 inches away from the enemies. This could be a way to get quite a lot of scary firepower right up close turn 1, and potentially get charges off on exposed areas of your army. They have a pretty scary war scythe in the Void Reaper. This one's strength 7 against vehicles, but wounds are 2 plus against everything else. It's AP 4, and it's a flat 3 damage. This really is the relic that's going to make a Lord or Destroyer Lord into a much more credible threat in combat. Finally, there's the Lightning Field, which can make a Catacomb Command Barge a lot harder to destroy with a 4 plus invul save, and it can also give you a chance of causing mortal wounds in combat. Finally, let's talk about stratagems, as these are some of the biggest areas where you can get caught out when playing against an army, as they have the ability to be sprung on you without knowing they're coming, unlike all the rest which has to be declared on the army list. Quantum deflection can make a quantum shielding vehicle that bit more annoying to remove, as you subtract one from the rolls, meaning that you're just that bit more likely to pass the saves. Certainly could be problematic if you're targeting something with damage 3 guns or something. 
Amalgamated targeting data is the Doomscythe one that we mentioned. Sacrifice the Death Rays for the chance to do 3d3 mortal wounds within a 3 inch bubble. And you add plus 1 to the roll to see whether it happens if the unit has 5 or more infantry in it. And subtract 1 from the roll if it's a character. So if you have big character vehicles, then that can actually provide some protection against this. Solar Pulse is an ability to ignore cover, so if they're firing at you with a large amount of shooting from one unit, so they will have the ability to shoot at you outside cover, provided they're willing to pay the command point. Resurrection Protocols is always one to be aware when you're fighting Necron characters. Basically for one command point, basically after you've slain a Necron carrier, the Necron player can roll the dice, and on a 4+, plus, that character just gets straight back up on one wound remaining at the end of the phase, so you can't kill them. That could actually be pretty devastating if they use it on some sort of fighty destroyer lord, or allow a powerful buffing character the opportunity to keep on doing his thing. For two command points, we can get the reanimation protocols for canoptic units, particularly devastating on wraiths, as we mentioned, meaning that you really do have to think about fully wiping units of wraiths, not just the standard Necron units that you know have the rule. Getting back models that are over 40 points on the roll of the 5 plus could be really problematic. For one command point, damage control override allows a vehicle to act on top profile for the rest of the turn. Could be pretty handy on Doom Scythes or Doomsday Arcs, though awesomely potent on something like a Tesseract Vault if they have one. Disruption fields can be used to give plus one strength to a Necron infantry unit. Could be good to get flayed ones to strength five or Lich Guard to strength eight. Dispersion field amplification is the one for the Lich Guard that gives them the three plus save and also the ability to rebound mortal wounds on the roll of a six when they're saving on this invul save. The last bit could actually be pretty potent. If they're targeted by high value anti-infantry fire, then it means that you could be receiving significant amounts of mortal wounds in return. This could really do a number on some of the night space ruin aggressors with their million shots. It's one command point for extermination protocols. This is the destroyer one that we mentioned earlier, and just turns those gauss cannons into very effective anti-everything weapons. V-rolling hit rolls and wound rolls just means that a strength 6 weapon like the gauss cannon is going to do very well against both heavy infantry, light infantry, and vehicles. For one command point, the Phaeron's Will can allow a Overlord to activate My Will Be Done on two different units per turn rather than just one, maybe two units of Tesla Immortals hitting on twos with exploding Tesla on fives. And finally, Adaptive Subroutines is the Canoptex Advance and Charge special rule. Could be good on either Scarabs or Wraiths to pull off far longer charges than you might expect them to, so be aware that they really could charge a lot further than you might think in one turn. So I hope that's given you a little bit of a better understanding of how the Necron army works. Typical things that you could expect to see in a Necron list are a relatively well-known tournament build known as the Doom Six, three Doomsday Arcs and three Doom Scythes. That just give you a very decent amount of firepower and that snazzy mortal wound attack that could really punish enemy castles. Things like an advancing infantry phalanx with an overlord, crypt tech, and potentially the warlord traits to make them fearless. A large unit of six destroyers to make use of that stratagem or maybe a large unit of six wraiths to be able to advance and charge, and maybe think about reanimating them with the stratagem. Necrons admittedly aren't considered the very strongest of armies right at the moment, in fact they're probably one of the weaker ones despite all of these rules. Though I think that if you aren't disciplined with firepower and let them do their resurrection thing, they certainly can compete relatively well even at tournaments. Throughout 8th edition we have seen Necron lists occasionally getting into top threes of tournaments in the hands of skilled players. I know that a lot of this might well change with the advent of 9th edition and their new codex, and of course their Psychic Awakening book, Pariah, but hopefully this is a good start to get a handle on the army and put the new releases and updates into context within the wider scope of the army. If you have any other insights or important things that you think I've missed or got wrong, please let me know down in the comments, and if there's anything important I've missed, I'll post a pinned comment as a correction below. If you've enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics for more Know Your Enemy type videos like this, and plenty of other 40k content. And if you've been watching quite a bit of the channel, I'd just like to mention the Patreon page, which allows me to keep these videos coming by having enough time to work on them away from my regular job. If you are watching regularly, then any support is absolutely greatly appreciated, as well as just keeping the videos coming, you'll also get to see some videos early, get to vote on what sort of videos are made next for the channel, and there's also the occasional prize draw where I post out some new miniatures to one lucky Patreon. If any of that sounds good, or you'd just like to help support, then please feel free to have a look at the link down in the description below. A big thank you to my current Patreon supporters, the channel wouldn't be where it is without you guys. In any case, a big thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.